Paola was a heavy cruiser built for the Regia Marina in the early 1930s as part of a class of four more balanced heavy cruisers as compared to the previous Trento class. Paola was built as flagship having a larger bridge structure of a different design that extended aft and fared into the forward funnel. Paola and her sisters of the Zara class had several interesting features, including a thicker belt and new 8-inch guns, and were heavier than their predecessors. Still, Pola and her sisters were able to keep up with the Trentos. After completion in December 1932, Pola served in several roles, including neutrality patrols in the Spanish Civil War, trips to Italy's overseas colonies, and supporting Italy's pre-war invasions. Once Italy joined the Second World War in June 1940, Pola served as flagship for Vice Admiral Riccardo Palladini and participated in some of the more notable early engagements, like the Battle of Calabria and Cape Spartivento. As the war expanded with the Italian invasion of Greece, Pola was transferred to serve with her sisters Zara and Fiume. While under the command of Vice Admiral Carlo Catanio on the night of March 28th and into the morning of the 29th, 1941, the three Italian heavy cruisers were sunk in succession at close range by Admiral Andrew Cunningham's Mediterranean fleet. While the Trentos were still building, doubts about the effectiveness of their scanty protection were voiced. By the end of 1928, the Regia Marina began looking for a more balanced heavy cruiser design, with more emphasis on protection and less on speed. These studies produced the four-ship Zara class, whose standard displacement exceeded the Washington Treaty by almost 2,000 tons. By going over the treaty limitation, it allowed the Zaras to embark the same armament as the Trento class, with an armor belt 150 millimeters thick. Granted, it did mean the ships had reduced power with 95,000 shaft horsepower and two shafts, saving weight on boilers and turbines, but it did not prevent the cruisers having an acceptable speed of between 30 and 31 knots. To save even more weight, the new ships had a long forecastle extending to the base of the tower. Shifting gears, all four ships were equipped with a new 8-inch 53 caliber gun and Saldo model 1927 or 1929, which although still in a single cradle like the guns found on the Trento class, had a higher rate of fire and were generally more reliable. Secondary armament was similar to that of the Trentos, and the after 4.7 inch mounts were replaced by four 37mm light anti-aircraft guns. The four cruisers, like their predecessors, were named after cities Italy had acquired after 1918, and were laid down between 1929 and 1931. Pola, as I mentioned in the introduction, was built as a flagship, having a larger bridge structure of a different design that extended aft and fared into the forward funnel. Take from Maurizio Bereschia's book, Mussolini's Navy, a reference guide to the Regia Marina, the four Zara-class ships are surely the best Italian heavy cruisers, and the exceptional conditions of the losses Zara and Fiume at Matapan, wrecked by 15-inch shells fired at almost point-blank range, do not allow a fair judgment of their robustness to be made. At the Battle of Cape Spartivento, Pola hit the cruiser HMS Berwick with two 8-inch shells, knocking out one of her 8-inch turrets. In the brief gunfire action of the First Battle of Sirte in December 1941, Barizia damaged the destroyer HMS Kipling with a near miss. As for a particular, she was laid down in March 1931, launched in December 1931, and completed in December 1932. Displacing around 11,900 tons standard displacement and 14,500 tons full load, her machinery consisted of two shafted geared turbines with steam provided by eight boilers giving her 95,000 shaft horsepower and more than 110,000 shaft horsepower on trials, with speeds varying between 30 and 31 knots in operational conditions and a max of 35.2 on trials. Granted, the ships weighed about 11,000 tons, so less than standard displacement while on trials. Her armor was thicker than the Trentos, with the main waterline belt being double that of the Trentos, having 150 millimeters or 5.9 inches in thickness. The main deck was 70 millimeters or 2.75 inches, and the conning tower and main turrets on the face also had 150 millimeters or 5.9 inches in thickness. As for armaments, Pola carried eight 8 inch 53 caliber guns and twin turrets, two forward and two aft. Initially, she carried 16 4.7 inch 47 caliber guns and twin mountings. In 1937 and 1938, this was reduced to 12 to allow for more light anti aircraft guns carrying 37mm anti-aircraft guns and eight 13.2mm machine guns. She also carried two RO-43 floatplanes that could be launched from a catapult. Pola's pre-war career is fairly similar to another Italian cruiser we've covered, Bolzano. So to hear about that, please watch my video on that ship. By June of 1940, when Italy joined the Second World War, Pola was serving as flagship for Admiral Riccardo Palladini in the 3rd Cruiser Division with Bolzano and Trento, ready for action. 
Unlike the Italian army in North Africa, which faced supply and logistics issues, ports like Tripoli, Benghazi, or Tobruk had not been properly readied for war. This leads us to early July, when an important Italian convoy consisting of a passenger liner and five freighters loaded with a little over 2,000 men, tanks, vehicles, and critically 16,000 tons of fuel and supplies departed Naples and Catania for Benghazi on July 6th. Initially, only the 2nd Cruiser Squadron, the 10th Destroyer Squadron, and six torpedo boats had been allocated to escort the convoy. Once learning the British were putting out in force for a different reason, the Regia Marina put out with two battleships, the Conte de Cavour and Giulio Cesare, along with six light cruisers and 20 destroyers from Taranto, led by Vice Admiral Inyo Campioni, along with Vice Admiral Riccardo Palladini aboard his flagship Pola, his six heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, and 16 destroyers from several bases in Sicily. After Mirzo Kabir, the British position in the Mediterranean was strained. To help strengthen it, the British intended to re-establish Malta as a major base, wherein it was decided to reduce the number of non-combatant servicemen and dependents on the island. These were to be removed in two small convoys. Admiral Andrew Cunningham was to interpose his Mediterranean fleet between these convoys and the likely route Italian surface forces would take. Simultaneously, Force H under James Somerville would create a diversion by raiding Cagliari on Sardinia. Cunningham left Alexandria late on the 7th of July. The front of his force was Admiral Tovey's five light cruisers, followed by his flagship Warspite and five destroyers. Bringing up the rear was the slow group comprising the battleships Malaya and Royal Sovereign, the carrier Eagle, and ten more destroyers. The British were spotted on the 7th by an Italian submarine. And the following morning on the 8th, the British torpedo boat Phoenix sighted the enemy main body, reporting it as midway between Italy and Benghazi heading south. The convoy the Italian main body was protecting reached North Africa later, delivering the supplies. At 10 a.m., Italian aircraft flew out of the Dodecanese in Libya, subjecting Cunningham's fleet to a series of high-level bombing attacks. With one bomb hitting the cruiser Gloucester and near misses lightly damaging Warspite in Malaya. While at 3 p.m., the Italian main body turned eastward to meet the British as the British steered roughly northwest. Decoded British radio signals led the Italians to expect Cunningham off the Calabrian coast at noon on the 9th, with Mussolini ordering Campioni to postpone battle so the Regia Aeronautica could attack the British the next day. By 6.40, both Italian fleets, Palladini's cruisers, and Campioni's battleships were headed north-northwest. The morning of the 9th at 7.32 a.m., Sunderland's from Malta found Campioni's fleet and tracked him for nearly four hours. It gave enough time for Eagle to launch an airstrike, but not until 1.15 p.m. did a group of nine swordfish, who found Palladini's cruisers, launching torpedoes at the heavy cruisers, which all missed. The side of the carrier planes told Campioni that British warships were nearby. His cruisers launched six more float planes, one of which located the British 80 miles away to the northeast. Campioni, who had maneuvered his forces around, began to reverse course back to engage the enemy. Cunningham headed northwest until 2.15 p.m. when satisfied he had positioned himself in between Campioni and Taranto. His ship steaming in the three groups I mentioned previously, with Tovey's cruisers first spotting smoke on the horizon a half an hour later at 2.47 p.m. Gloucester had been sent to support Eagle, leaving a limited amount of cruisers. Pola and the other heavy cruisers were swinging into position at around 3.20 and began engaging the British cruisers and battleships. After the shooting faded away for a time and Campioni steered to engage Warspite and the other British battleships, Palladini and Pola were ahead of Cesare by 7,500 yards and engaging Tovey's light cruisers as the battleships duked it out. Tovey was at a distinct disadvantage facing the Italian heavy and light cruisers. By a little after 4 p.m., Tovey was overtaken by Palladini and Pola and the other Italian cruisers. However, when Giulio Cesare was hit by Warspite, it caused Campioni to react and order his forces to retreat not knowing the extent of the damage to his battleship. At 4.06 p.m., Palladini was ordered to withdraw. The heavy cruisers continued to fire as they retreated, as they had targets and were straddling Warspite. By 4.20, the battle was effectively over for Pola. Following this, there was no action for Pola in the Middle Sea, besides covering convoys and several other small operations. After the raid on Taranto in early November 1940 and the reshuffling of the Regia Marina due to the damage and the fact that Taranto was not safe for fleet units, the British commenced another convoy operation to Malta and then on to Alexandria. Three Royal Navy fleets in the theater were used as either a covering force in the case of Force H under James Somerville and Force D both from Gibraltar, or as a diversionary force in the case of the Mediterranean fleet from Alexandria under the command of Cunningham. 
Once the Italian High Command, or Supermarina, learned about the convoy operation MB9, they put to sea on the 26th to interpose themselves between the convoy and Malta. Two Italian fleets consisting of the First Fleet with the battleships Vittorio Veneto and the Giulio Cesare, along with destroyers under the command of Admiral Campioni, as well as the Second Italian Fleet under Vice Admiral Aquino with Pola, the other heavy and light Italian cruisers, and destroyers. The two sides began spotting each other early on the morning of the 27th and maneuvered around each other to get into position for battle and to cover the convoy in the case of the British forces. Somerville on HMS Renown began to get a bearing on what Italian ships he was facing and started a turn towards the enemy and requested Ark Royal to arrange a strike force to attack the Italian fleet coming towards his direction. By 1215, Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland in charge of Somerville's cruisers was pushing north with Somerville's flagship Renown pushing 27 and a half knots in support of them. Somerville ordered destroyers 10,000 yards northeast of Renown to push away any Italian destroyer counterattack. While on the Italian side at about 1215, Vice Admiral Pellegrino Mattucci, in charge of the 1st Cruiser Division including Pola, Fiume, and Garizia, was heading east at 28 knots in line ahead, with Vice Admiral Sansonetti's 3rd Cruiser Division not too far behind. They soon encountered Holland's cruisers, and Mattucci ordered his division to open fire despite direct orders not to by Campioni. Mattucci judged the situation, not apparent from Campioni's flagship, warranted action. Nevertheless, Pola and the other heavy cruisers began engaging the British at long range as Italian doctrine dictated, with Pola targeting HMS Berwick and altering course to port away from the British while Sansonetti's 3rd Cruiser Division began making smoke. A brisk gunnery duel between the British ships in range and the Italian cruisers, with Pola hitting HMS Berwick at least twice between 1220 and 1242. Berwick remained in action with only two functioning turrets. Once Renown began engaging the Italian cruisers, they began to disengage, with the 3rd Division disappearing into the smoke and the 1st Division going beyond the horizon shortly after. As this was going on, Arc Royal launched aircraft that began striking Italian ships, including Campioni's flagship Vittorio Veneto, not hitting the ship. The two sides continued to engage throughout the afternoon, which, to summarize the outcome of the day from the Italian perspective, this is what Vincent P. O'Hara has to say in his book, The Struggle for the Middle Sea. As for Campioni, although he had the mandate to be conservative, he had to preside over the loss of Italy's best opportunity to deal the British a sharp setback in a fleet action. As Aquino remarked, the use of these ships, which constituted at that moment nearly all of our fleet's effective units after the blow at Taranto, was decided by Supermarina mainly for reasons of morale, and to demonstrate that our combative spirit remained intact, but Campioni's days of command at sea were numbered. Following the battle and more fleet reorganizations and strikes on Naples that caused damage to the ship, Polo would be ready for action in late March 1941, where she would meet her fate. By late March, the war in the Mediterranean having expanded, the Regia Marina intended to sink troop convoys heading from Egypt to Greece in company with the Regia Aeronautica and the German Luftwaffe. To defend against such an attack, Admiral Andrew Cunningham put to sea with Warspite, Valiant, Barham, and the carrier Formidable, screened by cruisers and destroyers. The ensuing Battle of Cape Matapan between the 27th and 29th of March 1941 was one of the most decisive fleet engagements of the war in the Mediterranean. Following the action off Gavdos in the battle between Aquino's flagship, Vittorio Veneto, his cruisers under Sansonetti, and the British cruisers under Prudhomme Whipple, during which the British began sending carrier-based and land-based airstrikes against the Italian ships, targeting the Vittorio Veneto. However, Pola, who had not played a part in the engagement, was the unfortunate recipient of one of those British torpedoes and had to slow down to not hit her sister ship Fiume. Pola lost electrical power and drifted to a stop. Once Cunningham learned of the plight of Pola, he sent his ships to hunt for the Italians along with spotter planes to see what the disposition of the Italian fleet was. By nightfall, both Italian and British fleets were splintering into separate formations, as Aquino learned of Pola's plight at 8.10pm, in which some suggested sending destroyers to pick up the crew and scuttle the ship. Aquino refused this because of information from Supermarina, in which he thought the enemy formation 75 miles to his east was Purdom Whipple's cruisers. He felt that the 1st Cruiser Division could handle them. I had not the slightest idea that we were pursued so closely by the British fleet. Otherwise, I should not have abandoned the Pola to her fate. So, the 1st Cruiser Division, including Zara and Fiume, went to assist Pola along with the 9th Destroyer Squadron. At 10.10pm, as Valiant's radar pinpointed Pola about 6 miles to the southwest of the British battleships Warspite, Barham, and Valiant, Vice Admiral Catania approached from the south with Fiume's crew getting ready to pass a tow. 
The night was moonless and cloudless, and visibility was not great, hovering at about 5,000 yards. Pola sighted shapes to the north, and believing that they were friendly, fired a red flare to advertise their location. Zara saw the flare 45 degrees off her port bow, and turned in that direction. At 1025, one officer on Catano's bridge saw large warships off the bow, and it turned out Catano was unwittingly crossing Cunningham's T. Cunningham reacted rather quickly and swung his ships around to engage the Italians. This quote comes from Dark Seas, the Battle of Cape Matapan. The next few minutes were decisive. The CNC altered course to starboard, bringing the fleet again into a single line ahead. Almost at the same time, Greyhound, which was then drawing ahead, opened her searchlight. Its beam fell right across the water, most valuably illuminating a cruiser without revealing the position of our battleships. The formidable being obviously of no value in a gun action, hauled out of line to starboard. The Warspite's turrets opened fire, followed almost immediately by the Valiants. A salvo of 15-inch shells crashed into the Fiume, her after turret was blown overboard, she listed heavily to starboard and burst into a sea of flame. She was driven out of line and it seemed to have sunk or blown up 30 minutes later. Just before the enemy cruisers were sighted, the barm in the rear of the line had sighted the Pola on the port quarter, making identification signals, and had trained her turrets onto her. When the Greyhound's searchlights shone out, the barm trained forward at once, opening fire on the leading ship. A brilliant orange flash shot up from under the bridge, and bursts were along the whole length of the ship, which turned to starboard and made off to the westward, making smoke. Following this, Italian destroyers tried to get into the engagement, but due to the concentrated firepower of the British ships, they were not very effective. Fiume was sunk and fires raged uncontrollably on Zara, whose fate was decided early on the morning of the 29th when the destroyer Jervis put several torpedoes into her, and with a giant explosion at 2.40 a.m., she disappeared beneath the waves. Pola helplessly watched the slaughter of her sister ships. By 1.40 a.m., the British destroyers Havoc, Griffin, and Greyhound had been circling Pola ready to pounce. However, they had expended all their torpedoes, so again the destroyer Jervis came in to kill a crippled Italian cruiser. This time, though, she went in and saved 257 of Pola's crewmen. Then she stood off and fired one torpedo, and the Nubian launched another. At 4.03 a.m., Pola blew up and sank, losing 328 men in the process of the one-sided battle. Pola, like other Regia Marina vessels we have covered, is certainly a beautiful-looking warship. But due to the circumstances in terms of materials like the lack of Italian oil reserves, problems with ammunition, gunnery, technology, and tactics, the ship was limited in her capabilities. Kino, after the Battle of Cape Matapan, writes about some of these issues, writing, The consequence of limiting for some time our operational activities, not for the serious moral effect of the losses, as the British believe, but because the operation revealed our inferiority in effective aero-naval cooperation and the backwardness of our technology. Thank you all for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe as it'll help the channel to grow. Until next time, my friends, have a great week.